So I just want to revisit a couple of things quickly from last time, uh, go back over them, because Daniel 7 is, is pretty uh, intense and bears a couple of things bear repeating with a few more details. So let's read it again together just to kind of get back into the groove there. Daniel chapter 7, verse, verse 1. <coughs> Daniel chapter 7, verse 1. The word of God there says, In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed. So it's Daniel's turn now to get a dream, not Nebuchadnezzar. And then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters. Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night. And behold, the four winds of the heavens strove upon the great sea. And four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked and it was lifted up from the earth and made stand upon the feet as a man. And a man's heart was given to it. So there's Babylon. And another beast, a second, like to a bear and raised itself on one side and it had three ribs in the mouth of it between the teeth of it. And they said thus unto it, Arise, devour much flesh. That's Persia. After this I beheld and lo, another, like a leopard, there's Grisha, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl, not of an eagle. This one, the beast, had also four heads, and the dominion was given to it. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast. There's the Roman Empire, double application, historically the Roman Empire and the Antichrist kingdom, because that beast comes back, remember? We saw that in Revelation. The beast that was, is not, and it shall ascend. So this thing shows up twice on your radar. So verse 7, After this I saw the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, and strong exceedingly, and had great iron teeth, it devoured and break in pieces, and stamped the residue with the feet of it, and it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I could, okay, so pause there. See there where it says, it says ten horns? There wasn't really ten horns, ten heads to the ten kings of the Roman Empire. There wasn't ten kings. So, so we know that's Roman Empire because historically that's what came after Greece, Grisha, which is Greece. But the Roman, but the kingdom didn't have ten horns. You know when it does show up with ten horns? Over in Revelation. Right. So what's happened there is inside that verse is Daniel just jumped forward to the second coming of that beast. Okay? The Roman kingdom didn't have ten horns. Now a lot of people, so here's what happens. I know there's all kinds of stuff on this on the internet, and all and, and all people have written me have wasted a lot of ink really uh, to try to figure these things out. Remember, I told you because Daniel sees the vision in the night, and the night is a picture of the church age. Then the vision applies also to church age empires. Okay? So historically, we had. And this is very important in Daniel, so we'll, we're going to go through it a number of times here. And historically, you had you had Babylon, and then you had uh, Medo Persia, and then you had Grisha. Yeah, the other key, yeah. Because I want seven fifteen when it's off, right? But it's it's so early. There's still time. Okay. Oh, okay. Two, three, four, and then Rome. So, of course, that would be your lion here, and then that's your um, bear, like a bear, like a lion. Your leopard, and your diverse. I'll call it diverse because that's how Daniel describes it. It's different. It's another beast. I guess you could tell the Roman Empire, vous êtes un animal étrange. And so, when he sees... Okay, so let's pause for a second. Remember the first time we see those kingdoms in, in Daniel chapter 2, we see them as um, an image. Remember that? And it's gold and silver and brass and iron and clay. So, when Daniel sees... But that's how Nebuchadnezzar sees them. The dream of Nebuchadnezzar, he sees them as like this great, brilliant, majestic image and its precious metals. Daniel's, now it's Daniel's turn to dream about those things. And the way God shows them to Daniel, he shows them as a bunch of uh, carnivorous, you know, cross-devouring beasts. 
that's like God's God's point. Larkin has a great point on that. That that mankind sees the kingdoms of mankind as those great, wonderful things. You read about the empires in history. Oh, the great Roman Empire and the great Hellenistic uh, period that brought culture to the Middle East and to the East. You know, that's how they they're described in those like glowing terms. And then, but when you get to Daniel's vision, the biblical vision. God doesn't see them as this great image. He sees them as a bunch of beasts trying to kill each other and dominate each other. Okay. Now, some of the people will make a point saying, well, uh, some of the people will make this point, even including like you know our kind of uh, our people. They'll make the point. They'll say, well, this was in chapter two. This is in chapter uh, seven. So this is the image here. Okay, this is the image. And they'll say, since this is in the night, and the night is the church age, then those four are not the same. That's hard to do, okay? You can't say they're not the same. What you can do is you can say there's a d double application, okay. So, they'll try to make a double application then to that. So, I think like Dr. Eckman, he'll say that the line with the, uh, uh, with the wings is, is England, because England has line with wings, or, 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 or the bear. Oh yeah, that's what happens, he shifts them. I'm not going to go into all that stuff. And how to apply this to church age kingdoms. I won't. Because honestly, guys, nobody's done a good job at it. It's too complicated. It's too loose. And if you don't have solid ground to teach something, you shouldn't teach it. Okay? I mean, Dr. Dr. Eckman, see, if you stick with the classical interpretation, uh, you've got uh, the lion with the wings. Okay, here's what he says, because you need to know, because probably some of you read his books. You've got the lion with the wings, he says that's, you would have to say that's England, because England is the one with the lion and the wings. You've ever seen, like, you've gone to England, you know, yes. London, they've got a lot of those statues, right? However, him, remember, he shifts them down one. We saw that, remember? He puts the lion here, and he puts the bear here, and he puts, he puts the leopard here. Uh, leopard, and then he puts the last beast, which is the, the Antichrist kingdom, down here. And he says, the lion is England, and that matches Persia, because the first king of Persia was Cyrus, and what did Cyrus do? He let the Jews go back. And what did England do? They let the Jews go back in 1917. Okay? But to do that, but to get, to get that match, you're shifting them down one, and we already saw that doesn't work. You can't, like, look, if you shift them down one, you have to explain a whole bunch of things. So, if lion is this Persia, and the bear is Risha, then the leopard is Rome. How many leopard, how many heads does the leopard have? Four, right? Yes. Rome didn't have four heads. Very briefly, during the church age, like for a few years, there was actually two emperors, and each emperor had an assistant. Okay, but this is really, really hazy stuff. And a lot of people who don't take the prophetic approach to the book of Daniel, those who are not premillennial, they'll tell you like, uh, oh, this is the Roman Empire, the ten kings are the ten, uh, they're the ten uh, European nations that arose during history, the Goths and the Visigoths, and oh, there's a thousand ways to do it. You, I mean, literally, like books like this, trying to figure out who those, who those animals were during the church age. It's hard to do. It's hard to do. All I'm telling you is the best way to look at it is that to look at it that these match like this. And what Daniel does is he jumps over. And many times the Bible does that. Okay. You can make an application of the church age kind of spiritually. But Daniel sees these things. You're given these things in the book of Daniel. And then it jumps over. Especially this one. The last beast. It jumps over the church age. And it lands you... Uh, in the tribulation with the kingdom of the Antichrist. If you want to make an application to the church age, that will be a secondary application. Secondary application. You can say, like, maybe, I don't know. Uh, see, the other thing is, if you make application of church age kingdoms, and you say, well, God only counts the kingdoms that ruled over Israel, nobody ever mentions the Muslims king Muslim kingdoms here. Because during the church age... During the church age, the ones that ruled the land of Israel most often were the Muslims. Muhammad takes over, uh, uh, the Muslims take over, the Arabs take over the land of Israel in the 8th century, in the 700s. 
Okay? And then the, the Crusaders kind of get them back temporarily during the year 1099. And then after that, you've got the Ottomans and the Mamluks who take over until, until Britain comes. So the question is, if you're going to make those church-age kingdoms, why are you ignoring the Muslim kingdoms? That, because they did rule over the land of Israel. Much longer than the British did. The British ruled over uh, Israel from 1917 to 1948. Like 31 years. That's nothing compared to how long the Muslims ruled over it. And yet they completely ignore the Muslim kingdoms. So, it's like, it's like watching CNN, okay? It's like some of us watch it so you don't have to. Mm -hmm. This is kind of what has you have to do with the commentators. I'm, I'm reading this stuff so you don't have to read it. <laughs> if you want, you can go read it. And they're just going to confuse you. And you're going to have... You're going to read 20 commentators and you're going to have 25 opinions on how these match church age kingdoms. You have to remember, this thing here was a mystery. The church age was a mystery, nobody knew about it. So the prophets saw like this. They kind of saw over it. They, they saw over it. So Now, when you get to the this, Daniel is listing them historically. Babylon, Persia, Greece, Roma, but then he tells you it's got 10 horns. Well, the Roman kingdom never had ten horns, but it will have ten horns. Where? In Revelation 17 and uh, does it mention 13? Yeah, I think the 13 too. They're mentioned. So, Daniel himself sees the first application, sees the second. But remember, because this was a mystery, this and this overlap. Remember, there's a famous uh, drawing on, by Larkin on his chart. Mm -hmm. he, draws, he draws a man. Horizontal. Yeah, so you've got like a man looking like this, right? You've got a guy uh, looking like this. He's looking, there's his eye. And he's looking like this, and there's a mountain here, and there's a second mountain here, and there's a valley here. And so, from this point of view, how many mountains do you see? Only one. One. From your point of view, you only see one mountain, because those two peaks, relative to your line of sight, look like they're one. Okay? That's how the prophets saw. Peter, I'm not inventing this. Peter says this. He says that the prophets of the Old Testament diligently inquired uh, what, man, what or what manner of time did the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ, the cross, and the glory that should follow, the crown. Because the prophets were seeing sufferings and glory. The Messiah suffers. No, 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 the Messiah reigns. The Messiah dies. No, no, no. The Messiah has eternal life. And they're confused. Mm -hmm. And of course, the solution now we know is that there were two comings to Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Okay? He shows up and says, the kingdom of God is within you. But then he disappears. He says, pray thy kingdom come. And we're still waiting for the kingdom. Mm -hmm. So it's the same thing with those beasts. Daniel sees a Roman kingdom here, but he's also seeing some elements from here. So, Roman kingdom in the past didn't have ten horns, but he's seeing that in the future it will. It's just that to him, they kind of look the same. This, this, is key to understanding all Bible prophecy. That gap there and how the prophets see and overlap. Key, key. Without it, forget it. You got no chance. Yes? Okay, maybe a little bit off topic and whatnot. So the church age is like 2,000 years. Before that, how long did the world exist? 4,000. Well, mankind, 4,000. And we can literally calculate. We're going to see that in Genesis. You can easily calculate that, actually. Uh, from Adam to the cross is 4,000 years. From the cross and hopefully to the rapture, 2,000 years. And that's a total of 6,000 years. So what's left? The last day. The last millennial day, which is the kingdom when, when Jesus Christ comes back to rest, and we rest with him. Amen. No more Bible Institute. <laughs> <laughs> He'll give the Bible yes. Institute. <laughs> okay. Um, I want to read you something. Here's an example of a historic application, uh, of a secondary application. Because I do want to relate it to some things that have happened in our history, modern day history. So this is a spiritual application. You saw the lion there has got eagle wings, and the eagle wings are plucked off. Right? We read in chapter 7, the, the lion has eagle wings, and then it says that the eagle wings are plucked off, and he's made to stand on the two, head, on the two legs like a man. Alright? The next time you read about eagle wings, look in Revelation chapter 12. I mentioned it last time briefly, but I want to show you something. It's kind of cool. Revelation chapter 12. 
Révélation 12, Revelation 12. You're still in Daniel, huh? Yeah, yeah okay, don't lose Daniel, please. So, look in Daniel chapter 7, verse 4. I'll get out of your way if you want to take a picture. Daniel chapter 7, verse 4. You know what would be cool? If we had like a modern technology that feels like a board and you press here and it clears the screen. My kids have a little thing like that. <laughs> They've got this little thing, you know, you, you, you draw. Remember those games? Yes. yes. They're yeah. more advanced now. You press on it, just... Wow. And you can start again. <laughs> or an assistant. Going. <laughs> okay, Daniel, Daniel chapter 7, verse 4. It says, The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked. So the next time you read about eagle wings in the Bible is in Revelation 12, 14. The Antichrist is persecuting Israel. And then in Revelation 12, 14, <laughs> you read this. And to the woman, which is Israel were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place, where she is nourished for a time, and times, and half a time, from the face of the serpent. So I'm reading this, I'm like, Lord, that's kind of strange. Like, are, are you implying that, that uh, the Israel flees with the help of the Babylonian Empire? Because it's the Babylonian Empire that's got the eagle wings, right? That's kind of strange, because the Babylonian Empire... Is the one that destroyed Israel <laughs> and took Israel. And then I'm reading up some history. Now, I'm not saying this is doctor, but I found that's fascinating. Listen to this. <laughs> as soon as Israel declared her independence in 1948, as many of you know, the Arab armies attacked. According to HeritageDaily.com, I'm, I'm going to read, this is a real story that I'm going to read to you now. After approval of the partition plan of Palestine in November 1947, so if you remember, the Jews were back in the land and there were tensions, they were fighting. The Arabs and the Jews were fighting. Great Britain was basically starting to side with the Jews at that point. Because at that point, they had just found out that the Arabs had what? Become a... Why, why are all of a sudden the Jews, they were letting the, 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 British, the Brits were letting the Jews back into the land. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden they turned against the Jews and they stood with the Arabs in the early 1940s. What, 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 what did the world discover that the Arabs had that everybody wants? Oil. 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 Yeah. So, once, so King Saud, it's at that time that uh, uh, King Saud took over. It wasn't Saudi Arabia before. He took, it was the, he took over it and it became Saudi Arabia. And then he basically told Roosevelt and Winston Churchill, if you want the oil, <laughs> if you want Aramco, you know, yeah. if you want Aramco, well, you know, we got a little problem there. We want Palestine. We want, we want Palestine. So the Brits, the Brits started siding with the Jews, and the Jews, that's where the Haganah and, the, and uh, all those guys started fighting against uh, the Arabs, and eventually they became the IDF, Israeli Defense Forces. So in 1947, that whole problem came before the United Nations. And so the United Nations were going to say, which is illegal, because internationally, the entire land from Jordan, east of Jordan River, there's the Jordan River, east, modern-day Jordan, the country Jordan, and west of it was promised to the Jews. So now they, they went back and, and Churchill kind of broke it off and he gave that to the Saudis and it became Jordan. The king of Jordan is just a Saudi. And then they kept the west of, uh, of Jordan, a little piece to Israel. And then on top of that, they were going to split that again even more between Israel and Arabs, Jews and Arabs. So that's 1947. Now, uh, Great Britain was the governing power and it continued to supply ammunition to Egypt and Transjordan while the entire world imposed an embargo on sale and shipment of military equipment to Israel. Don't forget, you can't see anything there. <laughs> <laughs> so 1947, the Brits keep on giving uh, guns to the Arabs and the whole world does an embargo. They won't give the Jews anything. I remember the Jews just came out of the Second World War. They have no state. There's no spy agency. There's no industrial complex. So those guys are like, you know, trying to figure out how they're going to fight. The whole world cut them off. The only exception, there was one country that broke the embargo. Anybody know who it is? Who it was? The country that still to this day has the lowest unemployment rate in Europe. Switzerland? No, Czechoslovakia. Now it's the Czech Republic because they broke off. They're still pro-Israel to this day. And to this day, lowest unemployment rate in Europe, Czech Republic. Lowest, number one. Okay. A landlocked country. 
Czech Republic is completely landlocked. <laughs> the only exception was post-war Czechoslovakia, which agreed to sell a substantial amount of German-designed rifles, machine guns, ammunition, and even, listen to this, fighter planes to the Jewish state. The problem for the infant state of Israel was transporting the vast quantities of weapons over 1,800 miles, 2,800 kilometers. The main obstacle they faced was that Czechoslovakia is a landlocked nation surrounded by countries that would not allow transshipment of arms in violation of the embargo. The buying agents for Israel, I saw a video on this, it's fascinating. They overcame this, so they went to California, they chartered C-54 transport planes and some C-46 planes, originally purchased as a war surplus in California after the Second World War. The pilots and the crews from the newly formed Israeli Air Force Air Transport Command then began an airlift that would astound the world. As part of the deal, the Israeli agents negotiated the purchase of an Avia S-199S, which was a copy of the famous ME-109. You say, what is that? That is the Nazi uh, airplane, the Luftwaffe, of the Luftwaffe. Remember the famous Nazi airplanes? Have you ever listened to uh, uh, Tom and Jerry, the cartoons? Yes. And you hear the sound of the airplane going... Yes. Yes. You know where they got that, that sound effect from? That sound effect is the sound of the Japanese kamikaze airplanes and the Nazi airplanes, literally, recorded. Okay, those are World War II real sounds of the airplanes. They record them and then they play them in the cartoons. That's, those were the airplanes that were bombing the Jews and the Allies. <laughs> yeah, I know. So I won't tell my kids that. Not as long as they're young. The Avia S-199 was constructed with parts and plans left over from Luftwaffe aircraft production that had taken place under the country's German occupation of Czechoslovakia. So the Nazis had uh, factories making airplanes in Czechoslovakia. When the war ended, some of the parts were left there. So the Jews got those parts together, the Nazi airplane, put them together, <laughs> and transported the shipments from Czechoslovakia to Israel. <coughs> One of the main aircraft they produced was a copy of the Messerschmitt BF-109G-6S under the name Avia S-99. Later, four such planes would scare and stop the approaching Egyptian army between Esdud and uh, at Halon Bridge south of Tel Aviv and save Israel. Thus God used German wings to preserve the Jews in their land. Mm -hmm. it, was a, it, was, it was a copy of the Messerschmitt. So, what, and literally, and this is, I mean, this is like history. Uh, what happened was nobody expected Israel to have airplanes because of the embargo. So there's a column of Egyptian army. Lebanon was part of it too, Syria and Iraq. Okay? So they're coming up from the, from the south. So the Jews, they send out four airplanes. Now nobody knows that they only have those four copies of Nazi airplanes. So when they start bombing, everybody's surprised. They're like, oh, they've got, they've got an air force. So they stop. They get the command. They get the order. They, Back in Egypt, they panic. They tell them stop because they don't know what to expect. And they bomb out the whole convoy. The whole convoy, and it was just those four that come back. I mean, I mean, listen. Do you tell me that stuff is normal? That stuff. Is not, that's yeah. it's it's Nazi yeah. wings that that gave Israel their independence. There's all kinds of documentary documentary stuff on it, and it's just amazing, man. Mm -hmm. Now, again, that doesn't mean that the Jews are all righteous and going to heaven. Okay, probably the guys that flew those planes died and went to hell. <laughs> like the guys that were shooting. Because they're all sinners without Jesus Christ. Okay? We're talking about on a national level, not on an individual level. Forget the individual level, that's a completely different ballgame. I just thought it was really interesting in history. Okay, let's uh, move on to something. Uh, look in Daniel chapter 7 and verse 6. And Daniel chapter 8. So Daniel 7 and Daniel 8. Daniel chapter 7, verse 6. After this, I beheld, and lo, another like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl. The beast had also four heads, and dominion was given to it. So there's your leopard. I'm going to write Leo. 
uh, four heads. Now look at chapter 8 and verse 8. There's Greece. But this time, Greece shows up as an he goat. So a male goat. You say, how is that possible that two different... I read this in a... I have to do this for Bible Institute. The Bible Institute I studied that, okay, that I graduated from. They say one of the rules of Bible typology is that the, uh, the same symbol can't mean two different things or two different things can't mean the same thing. Okay, guys, that's not true. Okay, that's not true. This here, the leopard is Greece and the he goat is Greece. Okay, I'll be able to say, well, it can't be because they're two different. When Joseph has the first dream, remember what was Joseph's first dream? The, the sheaves of wheat, they bow down. His second dream is what? Stars. The stars. Now, there's some distinctions, okay? There's some distinctions that we can draw from those. We'll see them in Genesis. But both dreams have the same meaning. True. Pharaoh has a dream the first time. He dreams about seven cows that come out. They're fat. Yeah. They're feeding in a meadow by the river. Then the next uh, cows, the kind that come up, they're, they're uh, lean fleshed and they eat the seven fat cows. Then he goes to sleep again. He dreams again. He's got... It's a, it's a sheaf of corn it has got seven stalks, rank and good and full. And then you've got seven dry, and the east wind dries them up. And then Joseph tells Pharaoh, the dream is one. So sometimes it can happen that two different symbols are pointing to the same thing. They give you different angles. So there's nothing wrong with, with seeing the leopard at one point as Grisha, and uh, he another time seeing it uh, as a... Uh, as an eagle. It'll teach us different things. You know, the Lord uh, Solomon says, oh, what is it? I always forget that second part of the verse. He says, there are four things which are calmly in going in Proverbs 30. Remember that? Like there's four wise things. Mm -hmm. And then he says, there are four things that are calmly, they're just beautiful to look at. Mm -hmm. And the first thing he says uh, is, um, I'm always surprised that it doesn't say horse. But there's a he goat, there's a, a, a greyhound, and a king against whom there's a rose, a lion, which is strongest among beasts and turneth not away for any. But one of the things he mentions is a he goat. That's beautiful to watch a he goat. Yeah. There's a video, I saw a video about a year ago. There's a dam, you know, a set, a little bit. Uh, uh, a dam. Barrage. Barrage, thank you. A barrage. And it's like a 10 degree, I mean, I'm not kidding, man. It looks like, that thing looks like a 15, 20 degree angle, like this. And there's ibex, you know those goats? Yeah. And they're climbing up the stones. Yeah, at like a dizzying height. And like eating little things coming out of between the stones. It's like, it's, it's hard to believe that you're seeing that. It's just amazing. And, and it's the same idea here, it's speed, and here it's ag agility. And Alexander the Great's conquest was amazing. So you've got four heads here. Well, what happens to the, the he goat's got one horn. That's a horn, okay? Not a TV. <laughs> you know what happens? Look at Daniel 8.8. 8. Therefore the he-goat waxed very great, and when he was strong, the great horn was broken, and four it came up, four notable ones, toward the four winds of the heaven. So that thing breaks into four, matching the four heads here. That's how we know that the leopard is Greece. That's another way. That's another way that you know the leopard is Greece. So we'll see more into what those four are when we get to Daniel uh, chapter 8. <laughs> Any questions so far? In the notes, maybe I'll, I'll print that, uh, well, because some people are online. In the book, as because I'm updating it uh, as I go, but in the book around page, what is that page? Two hundred. Oh, well, that'll be easy to remember. Okay, page two hundred exactly. In the book, page two hundred. Because here's what's happening. In chapter two, you've got information about those nations. In chapter seven, you've got information about those nations, and in chapter eight, you've got information about those nations. And in chapter uh, 10, 11, 12, not really, but here, 
You've got three chapters that revisit the same nations over and over again. So you kind of have to make the connections across the chapters. So to simplify it, I've, I've written out a table for you that connects Daniel chapter 2, Daniel chapter 7, Daniel chapter 8, and Revelation 17. All the elements across the board on the table. Try to match all those. This is, you want to match those four chapters. Daniel 2, Daniel 7, Daniel 8, Revelation 17. We always want to get a broader picture as possible so we know what we're doing. So it's on page 200, and it summarizes all, summarizes all the links. Okay, that, this, this, this is for the exam. That'll, that'll be on the exam, okay? Because it'll help you, nothing hard, just, you just go, uh, you know, uh, a gold lion Babylon, okay? You've already done it for chapter 2, but it was smaller, so now we'll just expand the table. So you can also go into Daniel chapter 8. So it'll be like the leopard will match the he-goat, you know? The ten horns on the beast will match the ten horns in Revelation 17. And that's good to have. You can even like put it in your Bible in the back. And next time you just pull it out. You just you know follow the, how, it, how they all connect. And that will save you a lot of time. Yes? Page 200, it's in the Bible? No, in the book. Oh, in the book? Yes. It's not, okay. Yeah, I'll send it. If, I haven't, if you haven't sent it to you, no. give me your email again. I'll, I'll send it to you, please. Okay, now, there is a wild card amongst those, those uh, beasts. There's a little wild card here. After 2011, this is, this is another example of the danger of letting current events influence uh, the way you see the Bible. Okay. Because after 2000, if you remember 2011... 2001, September 9-11, 2001, when those airplanes or whatever they were, I don't really care about what happened, but, I mean, I do care, but, you know, September 11th, okay? <laughs> Am I getting into it, all that yeah. stuff? Uh, so, we said we've got a lion, a bear, a leopard, And, uh, well, the last one turns out to be a dragon. Okay. Dragon will do, okay, for now. <clears throat> what some people try to do, 9-11 happens, and it was Muslim countries. And then George Bush comes out with his war on terrorism and all that kind of stuff. So a lot of the Bible guys, Bible, the whole world was talking only about that. So a lot of Bible people, a lot of people got interested in the Bible. Every time there's an international crisis, you know, like, people go back to the Bible. kind of, And they're like, well, what does the Bible say about Islam and all that kind of stuff? <clears throat> Traditionally, we Christians, Baptists, Protestants, Evangelicals, whatever you want to call them, we've always said that the, 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 uh, the, uh, the beast is a Roman beast, is Rome. But when 9-11 when happened, everybody's like, well, man, like, it looks like the Muslim world's going to take over, mm -hmm. right? They're increasing demographically at almost an exponential rate, at least relative to the, to the Westerners. So now there's a need, and this is, this is the problem. People felt the need like, oh, well, we got to fit Islam into the picture. Yeah. Okay? We got to fit Islam somewhere in the picture here. We got like, so you know what some people started doing? They start doing, well, uh, you, had the, you had the gold and the silver and the brass and the, the iron. So what they did was they put here Babylon. <laughs> and since it was Medo-Persia, they went like this. If I remember correctly, I haven't checked that in a while. They went Persia or Media first. Media comes first. They went Media, Persia, Persia becomes Islamic, and they put here Islam. Okay, something like that. And so they started saying, oh, we've been wrong. It's not Rome, it's not Rome, the beast is Islam, the Antichrist is going to be Muslim. And that thing, in, the, in like 20 years ago, I mean, that, around that period of time, 
just mushroomed the books all over the prophecy books. Islam, it's going to be a, a, a Muslim antichrist. It's going to be an Arab antichrist. Blah blah. We've been wrong. And again, it's the bias of living in your day and age because the Protestants who were being persecuted by the Roman Catholic Church were saying it's Rome, 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 Rome. Now, because you see 9 11, all of a sudden, oh no, no, we were wrong. It's Islam, Islam, Islam. The other reason why those prophecy guys came up with it is because in the United States, you've got a sizable Catholic population. And if you come up with a book on prophecy saying that the, <laughs> the Antichrist is the yeah, Roman Catholic wrong. Church's system, yeah. you're not going to sell those yeah. books because the Catholic Church is not going to. But if you say it's Islam, everybody feels like they can unite against that, right? Yeah. Yeah. So it's a lot less dangerous. You ever saw the movie you Left Behind yeah. with Kirk Cameron and Eric? You ever wondered why the Antichrist is Russian? Mm. Everybody feels like in the way, yeah, we, we can all unite against yeah. the Soviets, you know? No mention. You know what saves people from the plague in that movie? Anybody remembers? Yeah, the pain. Yeah, communion. Oh, my they're dying of the pestilence and then they're given the communion. And when they take the communion, all of a sudden that heals them from like, from the mark of the beast. <laughs> well, that sells. Yeah. That's up. If you make a movie with the Pope coming up and going like this, and he's the Antichrist, <laughs> who are you going to sell it to? <laughs> okay. But there is, I think there is a wild card. I think there's a place there for Islam. If you can shoo it in if you want, but without changing the fact that Rome is Rome. Look at the Lamentations, uh, chapter 3, and look at Hosea 13. So Lamentations 3 and Hosea 13. Lamentations chapter 3 and Hosea 13. <coughs> and you'll see why I call this the wild card. If you can also get Genesis 16. Genesis 16. So Genesis 16, Lamentations 3. Hosea 13, Genesis 16, Lamentations 3, Hosea 13. Genesis 16, Lamentations 3, Hosea 13. Okay, look at Lamentations. Let's start with Lamentations 3.10. Jeremiah is lamenting. Of course, it's a great passage on Jesus Christ. Lamentations chapter 3.10. He's lamenting what God has done to Zion, to Jerusalem. And talking about God, he says this about God. Lamentations 3.10. He, that's God, was unto me as a bear lying in wait and as a lion in secret places. Bear, lion. But now this is God. And of course that makes sense. Who smote Job? The devil. Who smote Job? God. <laughs> you know, First Chronicles 21, 1 says that Satan stood against Israel and against David. Yeah. But, but, but in, in, in Samuel it says God. Because yeah. God allows Satan. So it's equally true on both sides. Okay? So what that's showing is that God is the one sending those, those, those nations against Israel as judgment. He told them, he says, I'm sending the Chaldeans. This is more explicitly stated in Hosea chapter 13. Look in Hosea 13. And this is, so what happens in Lamentations 3 is a fulfillment of the prophecy of Hosea 13. What, have, what you read in Lamentations 3 is a fulfillment of Hosea. Hosea had come before. Hosea was prophesying before Lamentations. You will see, we'll see that Lord willing in minor prophets. Look at Hosea 13.7. This is an amazing passage of scripture. This is God speaking and he's pronouncing judgment against, judgment against Israel. And in Hosea 13.7 he says, Therefore I will be unto them as a 
Lion, there's one. And as a leopard. So we've got lion checked off. We've got leopard checked off. I expect bear to show up too, right? Mm -hmm. All right, so he says, uh, as a leopard, by the way, will I observe them? I will meet them as a bear that is bereaved of her whelps. There we go. But there's a fourth beast, right? And what does he say then? I will meet them as a bear that is bereaved of her whelps and will rend. That means redeshire. I will tear. And I will rend the call of their heart, the kind of the covering above the heart there. And there will I devour them like a lion. What does he say next? Wild the wild beast. Now, does he name what the wild beast no, is? He doesn't. No. Does Daniel name what the wild beast is? Yes. I put dragon. No, he doesn't. I put dragon because of Revelation. But Daniel says the fourth beast was diverse. That's all he says. So Daniel's got an unnamed beast, and the Lord himself in Hosea prophesies an unnamed beast. Now look, God says, I'm gonna be like this and like this. You know what God is saying? God is saying, I'm gonna send Babylon against you. I'm the one sending Persia against you. I'm the one sending Rome against you. And I'm going to be the one sending the Antichrist against you. Because it's judgment for their disobedience, of course. Right? Now, but here's the interesting thing. Scripture with Scripture. That last beast is described as what? A wild. Look at Genesis 16. Genesis chapter 16 and verse 12. Who's that about? You guys remember who that? I'm sorry? You guys remember who that's about? Yeah, just, yeah, Ishmael. Yeah. Genesis 16, 12. The angel tells Hagar, and he will be a wild man. His hand will be against every man, and every man's hand against him, and he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. All right, that's 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 the Arab temperament. I know, I've got kids <laughs> like that. <laughs> okay, <laughs> they're wild, man. You know, it's a, and and that's the temperament, right? That's the temperament. So it's uh, I, I'm a lot more. I worry a lot more about Asians and their cold-blooded calculations. I worry a lot more about uh, Japhethites, Europeans, and their organizational and and, and analytical skills. Okay. I see a guy <laughs> running at me with like a butcher's knife and he's like dripping with blood and he's cutting off heads. The sight is scarier, but I, I think I'd have an easier time handling that. Because, ah, you know, it's like, pff, you know, blow yourself up kind of a, that's, yeah. that's, who, who does that, right? Yeah. Yeah. The, 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 the Brits will kill you with white gloves on and they'll be polite through the entire process. The Germans will process you like, a, you know, in a meat factory. And they'll, you know, they'll, they'll break, break up the process and analyze it and experiment on all that kind of stuff. But that, that's the temperament. So the fact that when the Lord says it's, the last one is going to be like a wild beast, that to me says there is some an Arab element connected with the kingdom of the Antichrist. And history bears that out. Hitler, more than anything in the world, more than winning the war, wanted to destroy the Jews. Now, supposedly, right, it's because they're not Aryan. They're not six foot white and blue eyed and blonde haired, right? So he wants to destroy them. But he worked with the Arabs. Omar Mufti of Jerusalem, I don't know if you know this, but there was an Arab contingent of Nazis. There was a meeting between Hitler and uh, Omar Mufti, which is like a, a, distant, a distant great uncle of Yasser Arafat. Few people know that, okay? And they met, and I've, I've got the pictures. We've got like you know, black and white pictures of, of an Arab contingent of Nazis in Jerusalem. <laughs> yes. But do you, do you connect, connect Ottomans to Arabs? No. Okay. No. Okay. I don't. Because the Ottomans, they're Muslims, but they're not Arabs. The Turks are, 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 are Shemites. They're originally the, the Turks that we know today in Turkey. <clears throat> they come from the Central Asian steppes. And uh, they, were, they were weaponized <laughs> by the Muslim Empire because they're excellent warriors. And excellent horse riders. Even the French to this day, it's, it is fort comme un Turc. Right? Yeah. And then the Turks, as the Muslim Empire moved west, they settled in, in, in um, what is modern day Turkey, which was Asia Minor back then. But no, it's a different people. The Persians, two different people. Yeah. That's what Omar Mufti is, supposedly an Arab, right? So the Arabs and Nazis work together. So that tells you, you know, mm. wow. they're going to be working together. 
I mean, I mean, look at it today, right? Rome, all, the Vatican, when they vote, they have observer status. But when they, when it comes to politics, the Vatican and the Arab nations are always backing the same same thing against Israel, mm. all all the time. Yeah, that's true. So, I know there's some exceptions here and there, especially now. Mor- I know, we'll get to, but Morocco is going to start teaching Jewish history yeah. in the schools. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> I can't believe it. Yeah. <laughs> The temple, man. Yeah. If, if you the next piece of news, the one yeah. the one I'm really looking for all the time yeah. is the temple. Yeah, I know. Once I see something, and the temple's yeah. coming up, man. It's like, oh, man. <laughs> build it, build it, man. I'll, yeah. I'll fly down there and help you build it. You know? yeah. <laughs> oh, that'll be good. Yeah. Lord, come. So, uh, you got. I, I remember my friend, uh, my Liban, she's a Lebanese Brazilian friend of mine in high school. She told me when she was in Brazil, there was a there's a lot of Lebanese in Brazil, like more than in Lebanon. And so they, they wrote the, they wrote like, they sent an email to the, the Nazi branch in Brazil or whatever like that. They're like, yeah, you know, Ohio, whatever, we're with you guys and everything. And the, the Nazi, those Nazi, the, they sent them back an email saying, we appreciate your support, but you're also one of the races that we want to eliminate. Oh, <laughs> oh my God. Oh, just, wow. When your hatred of your, of your half-brother, man, just blinds you, you know? 